Thank you. I hope that uh, you guys are enjoying your afternoon so far. We're really glad that you're here, or we're glad if you're joining us uh, via Periscope. We're super glad that you've tuned in. Uh, we're so excited <coughs> to be here at the Big Questions live event in Lawrenceburg. It's going to be a great time tonight. And if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we just want to say uh, what kind of what this is all about. We've taken uh, basically what we would consider some of the top five questions that people have about God, the Bible, the church, Christianity, and we've tried to, and we're trying to explore what the Bible has to say uh, about those questions. And so, tonight we're really excited to continue to do that, and we're just glad that you're here with us uh, to do so tonight. Uh, let me just say uh, that as we go, uh, it may be that you come across something or hear something, and, and you've got a question about it, you're curious about it, and uh, we uh, hope that you do come across something that you're curious about. We encourage you to ask questions. We encourage you to wonder and to learn and to grow because uh, asking questions is the way that we get closer to God by finding answers in the right place. And thankfully, we're looking in the right place tonight. We're looking in the Bible, God's inspired word, uh, to find out uh, the answers to our questions. So if you come across a question, uh, good news. Uh, you can actually text in a question during the course of the lesson, uh, and it'll come to my phone, and afterwards, what we're going to do is have an interactive Q&A where I'm going to sit here, Philip's going to sit here, and we're going to go back and forth and kind of go over some of the questions that you might have uh, come across during the course of study uh, about the subject, which brings us to the subject, and the subject for tonight is, how can I find the right church? There are a lot of churches out there uh, in this city, there are a lot of churches in the world how do I find the right one? We're thankful for Philip Jenkins, who's here to, to kind of fill in for Mr. Wayne Miller, who's not able to speak tonight. Uh, he's the youth minister at Mount Juliet, the Church of Christ there. He has been for, what is it now, six years? Uh, six years. And so we're really thankful to have him, and we're looking forward uh, to a, a good time uh, studying God's Word and a good Q&A after that. So, Philip, go ahead. Good evening. Again, my name is Wayne Miller. <laughs> so if you hear something tonight you disagree with or you don't like, Wayne Miller is my name. And, uh, no. I appreciate Wayne Miller, uh, but it, he said he's not able to speak. That's like literally true. And uh, and so he, he can't talk tonight. So uh, he needed somebody who could talk. And so I guess I'm the best they could get on the B team. Uh, but I'm glad to be up here. Uh, tonight to uh, to speak about a very important question. Uh, it's really good to be together tonight. How's everybody doing? Good day today. You tired? Uh, we uh, we've had a good time here uh, in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, and uh, we'll be here until Wednesday every night at seven o'clock, um, doing things like this where we try our very best uh, to answer tough questions using the Word of God uh, for answers. I don't have all the answers. That's maybe probably not a spoiler alert to a lot of you guys in here, but I don't have all the answers. But I know the one who does, and we can always take our questions to God. He's not afraid of this, and so let's always do our very best uh, to seek what God says in his word. So, how can I find the right church? How can I find the right church? Maybe you don't like that question, because it sort of implies that there's such thing, a such thing as a wrong church, and that kind of makes us uncomfortable, Right? How do I find the right church? Well, maybe the first thing we need to, to do is kind of think about that question. Is there a right church? Is there such a thing as a right church? Maybe it makes you uncomfortable because it sort of implies that other people uh, could, could be wrong or that a church might not be the right church. How can I find the right church? The question begins with the premise that there is such a thing as the right church. So maybe we should back up and, and honestly take a look at that idea. Is there such a thing as the right church? The right thing matters, doesn't it? The right thing matters. I'll tell you why it matters. Uh, guys, you don't you don't propose to your girlfriend with a cubic zirconia ring, right? <laughs> why? Well, the right thing matters to her. Uh, if you've ever been to the Red Box, y'all rent movies sometimes. Uh, go to Red Box, and occasionally I love like going to Red Box because there's companies that uh, they they call them. I guess you call the the companies that put these movies out, they call them movies mock blusters. 
uh, because they're not blockbusters. They're like trying to make a profit based on you making a mistake and running the wrong movie. So instead of like Frozen, there's a movie called Frozen Land. And it looks the same. It's really close. But if you brought that home, the right thing matters to your four-year-old because they're going to be mad you get the movie with Elsa in it. Um, there's another one called uh, Transmorphers. It's not the same as Transformers. Trust me. Um, there's a uh, Chop Kick Panda, which is not the same as Kung Fu Panda. Uh, and then maybe my favorite one that you can accidentally rent at Redbox: Sunday School Musical. It's not the same as High School Musical. Um, <laughs> So I'm told, I've never seen it, but, uh, but the right thing matters. The right thing matters. Let's, let's like pretend for a minute uh, that you, you go out on a date and you have to pretend maybe really hard if it's been a long time you've been on a date, but let's pretend uh, that, that maybe you're married and, and you go on a date and you hire a sitter and uh, the babysitter comes and is, is taking care of your two kids and, uh, and watching your kids. And, uh, and so you leave, you go out, have a good time, and, uh, and then you come home and the two kids that the sitter has are not the two kids that you left. And, and the, the sitter's like, what's the big deal? Why are you so picky? I got two kids, you, you got two kids, I got two kids here. You're like, it's a huge deal. The right thing matters. It's a huge deal because have you seen the Amber Alert? You're in trouble, babysitter. Um, the right thing matters. It matters, it matters. Uh, it, it's not called being picky. It's, it matters which child belongs to me. And the same is true of the church. You can't just slap a label on a building or a sign and just call it God's church. You could, but isn't that really the same? Is it kind of like taking a name tag and just putting it on a kid that doesn't belong to you? Um, what really matters is whether or not that church is right in the sight of God. What really matters is whether or not that church is right in the sight of God. And so, okay, maybe, all right, let's just pretend like double that from here. Okay, all right, I got you. I hear you. Uh, but to me, it's all the same. It doesn't matter to me where you go to church. One church is as good as another. Uh, they're pretty much all teaching the same thing. And so long as they love God and they love people, what more could you want? And, and God, that sounds great. That sounds right. And that sounds good. But what's the issue there? To me, it's all the same. It doesn't matter to me where I go to church. One church is as good as another, and they're all pretty much teaching the same thing. So long as they love God and love people, what more could you want? See, the issue is it isn't up to me. It isn't up to us. It isn't up to us to decide what's right and what's wrong. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter how how right that something feels or how right that I think something is. The most important question is, and this regardless of what we're talking about, whether it's the church, whatever such it is, the most important question is, does it matter to God? Does it matter to God? Does it matter to God where I go to church? Can a church be right or wrong in the sight of God? Well, let's look in God's word to answer that question. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation uh, chapter 1. If you would like to look there real quick. Revelation 1 verse 4. Uh, we read about there being seven churches in Asia. Now keep in mind, when John is writing this, there are not seven different kinds of churches to choose from. There are just seven congregations in seven different locations. And so there, there isn't a need for a sign on a church building. For one, they don't have church buildings. They have houses for each other to meet in. And uh, they met in houses. And, and number two... There weren't seven different kinds of churches to choose from. They're just all, all these different denominations didn't exist. And there was only one kind of church, Christ's church. Does it matter to God what a church is doing or teaching? Can a church be right or wrong in the sight of God? Well, the book of Revelation is clear about that. Look with me in chapter 2, verse 16. Jesus tells the church in Pergamum that they need to repent. That's a strong word. That really, you don't hear it a lot of times, like talking to people, like friends and stuff outside of the church. It's kind of a churchy word. It's a biblical word that really means change. So Jesus tells the church there, hey, change. The church in Sardis in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. This is Christ talking to a church. He says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. 
For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. In chapter 3, he says of the church in Laodicea, verse 15, he says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. All right, apparently, there's a kind of church that would repulse Jesus so much, he just would like, I can't even stand the taste of it in my mouth. We could go on and on and on. And books like 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Colossians, they're all written to churches warning of the importance of staying faithful. So yeah, a, a church can be right or wrong in God's sight. And if a church strays from the truth, it's got to get back on track. Remember that word, repent? That's that idea of, of coming back and, and changing and turning things around. So just to recap, does the right thing matter? Yes. Cubic zirconia, right? The right thing matters. Can a church be right or wrong in the sight of God? According to scripture, yes. Does it matter where I go to church? Yes. Why? Because it matters to God what the church is doing, what the church is teaching. So what do you look for in a church? What do you look for in a church? How, how friendly it is? Um, how many people it's in there? Do, uh, do you look at the age demographic? Um, do, you, do you look at the entertainment value? Is, is it boring? Uh, to go to church there. What do you look for? Listen. What I'm about to say is really hard for us to get and really hard for us to grasp as a society because it kind of challenges the way that we make decisions. Uh, we, we, uh, we like to make decisions based upon what we want. You know, like we go, uh, we pick out our cars and we pick out our, uh, our outfits, and we pick out our ice cream based upon what we like and what we want. But what if, what if we took a step back? And what if we put what we want aside, like our will and our desires and our wishes, what, what if we took our opinions and we set them aside and we made this decision, the decision of, of finding a church, and we made that decision solely based upon what God is looking for? Now that concept is crucial in Christianity, right? Maybe we apply it to a lot of other things in Christianity, like what does God want me to do? What does God want me to say? What kind of choices does God want me to make? Um, how does God want me to live my life? And maybe when you pray, you say things like, God, what do you want me to do today? You show me and I'll do that. But let's apply that same principle to where we go to church. What kind of church we identify ourselves as being a part of and where we worship. How can I please you today, God? What choices can I make that would make you proud? Kind of like Jesus would pray in the garden where he said, Not as I will, Father, but as yours, your will be done. Why wouldn't it be the same when it comes to the church? After all, it is his church. It's not the one that, that you or I died for, right? Acts chapter 20 verse 28 tells us that he obtained the church with his own blood. He paid for the church with his blood. He died for the church. In Ephesians 5.25, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How much did Christ love the church? Enough to die for her. That's huge. Does the church really matter to Jesus? I would say so. He died for it. That ought to cause us to rethink our attitude towards church. That ought to cause us to, to really think twice the next time we're tempted to lie in our beds and think, yeah, I should probably go to church today, but I'm really tired and i got to have my sleep. Just remember, Jesus died for that thing that you like to sleep through. Well, I love God, but but I really I really don't care so much for that whole church scene. I just I don't I don't like it. I, I don't really I just think you know churches are kind of hypocritical and Christians are hypocrites. I, I don't need it. You don't need that thing that Jesus died for. Maybe you should have told him that before he died for it. <laughs> Maybe you don't you don't lay down your life for something unimportant, right? When we talk about the church, we need to be careful. You ever heard people that badmouth the church? Like to talk bad about the church, talk bad about Christians? 
when you bad mouth the church, you do realize you're talking about Jesus' bride, don't you? You don't talk bad about my wife. Imagine how that must make Christ feel when people trash his bride, the church. So again, let's let's recap. The right thing matters. Cuban zirconia, right? The right thing matters. And so it matters where I go to church, too, because the church can be right or wrong in the sight of God. So how can I find the right church? That is the kind of church that pleases God and is pleasing in God's sight. What kind of church is that? What does it look like? I mean, there's a lot to choose from. There's a few characteristics of that church that I'd love for us to look at tonight. If you want to write these down, you can. This might be stuff you'd like to study later or think more about. How can I find the right church? Number one, the right church is the one we read about in the Bible. The right church is the one that we read about in the Bible. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said that the kingdom or the church would come with great power. His prediction required two things. If you look at Mark chapter 9, verse 1, he says that there would be some standing there that would that would have, see the kingdom come within their lifetime. So there were some people that were listening to him, standing around, that they were going to see the kingdom come. The other requirement was one of the identifying marks of the coming kingdom was that divine power would accompany it. In other words, when it came, everybody would see it, everybody would know it. There was no doubt about it because it came from God, divine power. Jesus also predicted that the church would come when the Holy Spirit came. He told his apostles in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that's what takes place in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. The words of Jesus came true. The Holy Spirit came, and, and so did the kingdom, and the church was born, and that's the church that we want to be a part of. That's the church I want to be a part of, the church in the Bible. Why? Because God built that church, and God blessed that church. That's the church I want to be a part of. Maybe you're new to the Bible. Maybe maybe there's somebody out there listening uh, that's, that's either new to the Bible, or, or maybe you've never studied it before. And, and maybe you've got a desire, maybe you've got an interest to learn more about God's Word. I, I just want you to know, if that's where you are, everybody starts somewhere, okay? And so if, if you want to study the Word of God, uh, there's a lot of people here at this church, at the Lawrenceburg Church of Christ, that would love to sit down with you. None of them are going to make you feel dumb or like you don't know anything. We're all just trying to be students of that book, of the Word of God. And we're all in different places. And so uh, we would hope if there's anybody out there that's interested in learning more about the Bible, uh, you let us know because it would give us so much joy to be able to sit down with you and, and learn together about God's Word. That's, that's what we all want to be, is, is disciples of Him and students of Him. So if you're new to the Bible, maybe this will help you. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Maybe you've heard of those four things before, but those are names. Those are four names of the uh, New Testament, the first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus Christ, how he came to this earth, how, how he lived his life on this earth, how he, he was teaching people and the things that he was teaching and the miracles that he was performing. It also tells the story of, of how he was killed and crucified and how he died for our sins. And the good news is the story doesn't end at the cross. The good news is three days later, he rose again. And so anytime that, that you got somebody that's like, hey, uh, I think the Bible uh, says something about Jesus, but I really don't know where to look. Well, this, this might help a little bit. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Anytime you got a question about a story about Jesus, it's probably in one of those four books. It is in one of those four books. They all tell the life of Christ. So someone comes up to you and says, hey, uh, Jesus said something about judging where was that? Well, you may not know exactly where it is, but you know the address of four books that it could be. Okay? That might help a little bit. You ever think about this? What happens after Christ leaves the earth? Like the apostles, these guys who spent all their time following Christ around and sat at his feet and, and they learned from him and they studied of his ways and they, they lived their life for him. When he leaves the earth, like what happens next? Well, here's something pretty cool. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The next book of the Bible is the book of Acts. The book of Acts, I don't know if you like sequels or not, but the book of Acts is sort of like a sequel. It tells the story of what happened after Christ uh, rose up from the grave and kind of like then what? What's the rest of the story? 
The book of Acts is awesome. So if you're writing stuff down, you might like to know this. The book of Acts, if you want to know where to study the New Testament church, the book of Acts tells the story of the church. It tells the story of the church, which is really, really cool because it's an amazing story. It tells how the kingdom came with power and how the apostles were able to do all these miracles because of the power of God that was at work within them. It teaches us how we can be saved and how they taught other people how to be saved. It was a continuation, as Luke would say in Acts 1, verse 1, in his first book, he's writing to a guy named Theophilus. I'm sorry if I'm losing you here. But he wrote to a guy named Theophilus, and he said, In the first account, my former account, O Theophilus, I told you about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. What's cool about the book of Acts is it picks up right there and it says, let me tell you the rest of the story. Let me tell you about the mission of the church. They continue to do the things that Jesus began to do and teach. What's the purpose of the church today? What's the mission of the church today? A continuation of the very things that Jesus began to do and teach while he was on this earth. That's where we come in. That's where we pick up. So maybe you learned something about the book of Acts. It's such a cool book. Um, since the right church is the one we read about in the Bible, wouldn't it make sense for us to do everything we can to be like that church? Like, that's, that's it. Like, how do we be like the church we read about, the one that God built, the one that God blessed? Where do we do that? Well, we look at the book of Acts. We read the epistles. We see the things that they were doing, the things they were teaching, the things they needed to know. Number one, the right church is the one that we read about in the Bible. Number two, the right church does what the Bible says. The right church does what the Bible says. Now, if that, if that sounds like really basic and elementary to you, that's, that's okay. In fact, that's probably good because it should be very basic and elementary. We should want to do what the Bible teaches. That's huge. I know that's simple, but that's so important. The church, the right church, is the church that does what God says. Why do you guys, why do you guys in the church make such a big deal about being right? It's not about being right and proving other people wrong. You know what I mean? Like, did you get that? It's not about being right and proving other people wrong. It's not about that at all. And if that's what it is with you, then you've missed it. It's about being right with God. It's not about winning arguments or, or making other people look dumb in their uh, responses. That, that's wrong. What's right is obeying God. That's right all the time. Period. Obeying God's always right. Obeying is always right. And if, if you follow God, you'll, you'll always be doing the right thing. Isn't that awesome? Don't, don't you want to know, like, when you're doing the right thing? Don't you appreciate when people give you feedback? Listen, anytime you're following God and you're doing what he says, you're doing what's right. The right church is the church that does what God says. Okay, disclaimer. What I'm about to say may rock your world. You may, uh, you may hear this for the very first time, and, uh, and you may not know what to do with it. And that's okay. I, I want to say everything in a, in a sincere spirit of love and gentleness. And if I say something that offends you, I promise you it's not my intention at all. Okay? It is my intention uh, to simply try my best to follow what God's Word is teaching. And so if you hear something and, and you don't like it, again, my name is Wayne Miller. <laughs> no. um, but for real, if you, uh, if, if you disagree with it, if, you, if it doesn't sit right with you, that's, it's okay to be challenged with something you might not agree with. What, what's not okay is to just stubbornly refuse to listen because what if God, what if God's word is teaching you something uh, that you have always believed and you believe wrong about it? And that could be all of us. And it probably has been all of us at some point. Okay, enough disclaimer. Um, I want you tonight to take an honest look at something. What if we took away all the traditions and all the creeds and all of the, the preferences that we might have. And what if we stopped accepting things just because it's, it's the way it's always been done? And what if we quit being so tied down to being uh, 
to being tied down what we've been taught by a church or by a preacher or by someone in our family, maybe with good motives and good intentions. But what if we stopped being so tied down to those things and we just went back to doing things the way that we see the church doing them in the New Testament? Wow. What if we did that? What if we honestly did that? What would that look like? And again, I'm not saying this to upset anybody. I just want to ask that question honestly. What if we stripped away all the extra stuff that has maybe been added on purpose, maybe not on purpose, maybe just found its way into wherever it is that you worship? But, but let's, just, let's just pretend that, that all these things that we've added, we can just strip them away, the things that are not found in the Word of God, all the things that, that, in, that in worship that are different. All the things that, that we sort of accept because they're traditions. And what if we just went back to the way that the New Testament church did them in the Word of God? What would that look like? Like, honestly, what would that look like? You wouldn't have instrumental music. You wouldn't have a piano. You wouldn't have an organ. You wouldn't have a band. you just have singing. You wouldn't have a woman preaching in the church where there were men in the audience. You wouldn't have a, a bunch of people at the end of a worship service bowing their heads and praying a prayer, asking Jesus to come into their hearts to be saved and then being baptized later on. Because that's not what they did in the book of Acts. You'll never read that. You would have elders in the church. They would be the overseers the ones making decisions, leading. You would have deacons in the church, the men who would serve, and they would be qualified in the way that the, Lord, the Word of God lays it out. You would have preaching, and you, you would have life-changing messages from the Word of God, not like comedy hour with feel-good stories about life. Maybe you've been places like that before where uh, God's Word has not even been read one time. Guys, his words carry so much more weight than any man's words. I don't care who the man is. And again, I'm not here to tell you I've got it all figured out. I don't. And it's not my intention to tick people off. It's just my intention to do what the Bible says. I don't ever want to be a part of a church that leaves the truth. If a church leaves the truth, I need to leave that church. We're here this week uh, knocking doors in Kentucky, which is such an interesting thing. Uh, some of you may have, have done that. I know some of you have done that this week, but maybe you guys are watching, maybe you've done that before, uh, like on campaigns or something. Uh, and it's definitely adventure. And I think that's one of the things I love about it so much. Um, you never know who's going to answer at the door. And you never know like what they're going to say or what their story is or what you catch them in the middle of. It, it's just an adventure every time you knock on a door. And um, it's wildly unpredictable, which I think is kind of fun. And uh, it seems like every every time that I go on a door knocking campaign, um, I will meet someone who will answer the door in this way. Well, you just keep on walking, because I've grown up such and such faith, and that's what I am, and that's what I'm always going to be, and there's nothing you can do to change my mind. Shut the door. I get it. I, really, I get it. Okay, I get it. Because I've been growing up, I've grown up being taught things too. Okay, I get it. But I grew up this way, therefore I will never change, is not the same as following God. You know what I mean? Like that's let's like if you really take a step back, that's a foolish answer. Um, I hope we'd all be humble enough to say, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe I need to study this deeper. Maybe I need to rethink this. Maybe I need to keep my mind open. Maybe God's trying to teach me something from the Word, and I've, I've already made a decision, I've arrived at a conclusion that I didn't need to arrive at. It doesn't matter. I love the church. I love the church where I attend back home. But if that church leaves the Word, I'll leave. It doesn't matter how many generations of my family worship there. It doesn't matter how much I've dropped in the collection plate over the years. If a church leaves the truth, leave that church. If we choose to worship at a church that doesn't follow the truth, 
what excuse could you possibly have that would be good enough to excuse you from following truth? Well, I know they don't exactly teach what the Bible says about so-and-so, but listen, whatever you say after that statement right there is really foolish. They may not do everything the Bible says, but well, then why would you want to be associated with a place that doesn't follow God's word? If a church leaves the truth, leave that church. Jesus, Jesus made a big deal about truth. When he was on the earth, he, he talked a lot about truth. He said uh, to God in prayer in John 17, 17, he said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Um, talking about the word of God. He said, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He said, true worship in John chapter 4 is in spirit and in truth. If, if there are things that look different in the church where you attend versus the church that we read about in God's word, which, which one will you follow? I want to be a part of, of the church that God built and God blessed. And if we're a part of the church that looks and lives like the one we'll read about in the word of God, we're going to be just fine. We'll wrap up here in just a minute. Let me keep going. The third point I got here is uh, the right church, number three, the right church is the one that belongs to him. The right church is the one that belongs to him. In Matthew 16, verse 18, you can turn there if you'd like to, uh, we read these words. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I know we're a part of the church, but the church doesn't belong to us. And if we start making that it does, and if we start making decisions based on the fact that we think we owe all the church, we've greatly misunderstood something very, very important. Um, it's sort of like if you took if you took the keys to my car uh, from me and you decided to drive my car to San Francisco, um, we call that like hijacking, like you've hijacked my car. Have we done the same with the church? Have we hijacked the church? Have we taken something that doesn't belong to us and misused it? Um, a car that doesn't belong to you, that's like hijacking. Uh, it, it belongs to the one who purchased it, whose name is the car in. Well, the church is, is like that. It belongs to the one who purchased it, the one whose name it belongs to. Christ is the one who purchased the church. He bought it, and it's in his name. Matthew 16, verse 18, he says, it's my church. Why do I want to be a part of that church? Well, Matthew 16, 18 says it. Hell can't touch it. If I'm a part of Christ's church, Satan can't win. He can't prevail against me. Why? Because I've been purchased by his blood. His blood has paid the price for me, and, and we don't have to be afraid to die. If I'm a part of that church, game over. Satan loses. I'll leave you with, with two thoughts, and then we'll take some questions. Wouldn't it be awesome? You think about all the churches in America today, uh, especially in the South. Wouldn't it be awesome if churches didn't have to have a sign outside the building, like that kind of blows our mind to think about. Um, but what if it just said Christians meet here or something like that? What would that look like? How would that work? What What if all people everywhere that wore the name of Christ decided to put all of their differences aside? and worship together and stop having all these different teachings and different beliefs, what would that look like? It would look like the book of Acts. And it would look like all of us laying down our opinions and coming back to the word of God. And all of our preferences and all of our opinions and coming back to the word of God is the only thing that can unite us. I'll close this story that I borrowed from Wayne Miller. In South Africa, a group of, of boys were playing with marbles, and uh, and they were playing with some small, round, uh, dark-colored rocks. They're playing marbles with these rocks, and uh, upon investigation, someone discovered that those rocks weren't uh, rocks at all. In fact, they were uncut diamonds, so a really priceless rock. But you think about that. They they were using diamonds as marbles. They were playing games with something worth a fortune. Tonight I want to humbly ask you a question. 
And it's the same question I got to ask myself too. Have we been guilty of playing games with the church? This priceless gift that God has given to us, have we treated it like a game? Or do we see the church in the same way that Christ does? Let's strive to see the church and treat the church that way. All right, question time. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I don't know if you guys caught this or not, but uh, he said Jesus loved the church so much that he was willing to die for her. Well, I thought that was just the highlight of the message. That was powerful. Uh, we want to take the church seriously uh, because Jesus was willing to die for her. That's awesome. Hey, listen, we had a lot of people respond tonight uh, and text in some questions, and so uh, we just want to get started. You're on the hot seat, I okay. guess. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> get prepared, get ready, yeah. get mentally get ready. Lots of water. Yes, exactly. exactly. So, yeah. no. uh, okay, well, listen, I'm just going to start uh, with this question. We talked a lot about how uh, there's a need to find the right church, there's a wrong church. But if somebody texted in a question and said, my friends, don't necessarily go to what I think is the right church, what's a way that I can reach out to them to help them find the right church? And I know you got a lot of youth experience, so yeah. this is just kind of right in your wheelhouse, I hope. I would hope so. Um, thank you. Okay, so the question is, um, how do I talk to a friend that maybe goes to a church that when I'm looking at God's word, things don't jive exactly? Right. Uh, there's differences in what the Bible says versus what the church might be teaching. Um, how do you handle that? Uh, I think the Bible gives two important ingredients with every conversation that we have, because those are really tough conversations to have. Uh, but I love the passage that talks about how we're to speak the truth in love. And, uh, and I hope that that's what was done uh, tonight. That, that was my intention and my prayer. Uh, but as far as you know, talking to a friend, those conversations can be uh, very delicate. They can be very tough. Um, but instead of going into attack mode and and you know making it a, a debate of why I'm right versus you're wrong or why my church is right versus why your church is wrong, uh, those those conversations don't go very far and they don't they don't do much good. Uh, I heard Tim Martin is a guy that I work with, and I heard him say this one time, and it really stuck with me. Nobody gets argued into becoming a Christian. And I've never met anybody that that was the case. Um, I've, I've met a lot of people that have become Christians, but I don't think I've seen anyone that's been argued into it. And so, um, you know, I think maybe something that you might try, if, 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 that's, if someone in the room asked the question, I don't know where it came from, but, um, you know, maybe sitting down with that friend and saying, hey, have you, have you ever thought about what, what God's word says about this issue or what God's word teaches about this issue and their answer might be I've never really studied that I've grown up in the church being taught this but I really don't know what it says and and I think there's an opportunity there for two people to sit down and just look at what God says in his word and and leave the fighting out of it and just try both two friends opening God's word and being very honest about what you're learning Absolutely. And, and this kind of goes uh, on the other side of that question. What about, and this is another question you have, what about uh, when somebody currently goes to a church where they feel very spiritual, uh, they're going to the worship service and they're feeling really uplifted, they're feeling very uh, spiritual while they're there. The question is, how can this be wrong? Isn't God mostly concerned with love anyways? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, how, can, how can something be wrong when everything feels really right about it. Um, I think I think it's important to just remember, like I would caution anybody that, that starts to think that way, to just remember that sometimes you can feel something and you can be really wrong about what you feel. Um, I think about a few, I guess it's like a year ago maybe, when the dress came out uh, on social media that it, it like made people mad. Uh, if y'all remember the dress, it was like a gold, some people saw this dress as gold and white and some people saw it as uh, black and blue, I think, were the colors. And uh, it started like this Twitter war, and uh, people got really mad at each other and really been out of shape. And um, it was like, you know, team black and blue and team white and gold, and people just like ganged up on each other. And uh, like for a you know, 24-hour period, it was just like dividing a line, and you know, you had friends on either side. And um, 
the thing was to me it was it was weird. Like science, scientists looked at it and it was it was kind of this weird thing. I can't remember what they called it, but it was it was a, it's a very rare thing that it's, it's like a trick that's played on your eyes where you can see something a certain way, but just because you saw it that way doesn't mean it was the way it actually was. Is this going? Is this making any sense? Because uh, I saw the picture of the dress and to me it looked black and uh, it looked white and gold, but then I saw a picture of the actual dress, a different photo in a different light. And it didn't matter how much I felt like the dress was white and gold. The reality was it's, it's black and blue. And so it doesn't matter how much I feel something, I can still be really wrong. And uh, in Jonah chapter 4, um, Jonah feels really angry because Nineveh, um, God forgave Nineveh. And you know, like, they repented and, and Jonah gets really mad, which is weird. But Jonah feels really angry. And, and so, you know, you think, well... I can feel however I want, and it's not wrong for me to feel that way. Well, we read that God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Like, do you have a right to be angry about this? And and apparently, Jonah's feelings were wrong, you know? And I think about in John chapter 4, when Jesus is sitting down with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and he says, true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth, and God is seeking such worshipers to worship him that way. Um, spirit would have to do a lot with your feelings and your emotion and your heart. So as you worship, yes, bring your heart and bring your mind and bring your spirit to worship. Um, we ought to feel things in worship, right? That's what Jesus would teach us. But we can't have one and not the other. He says you must worship in spirit and in truth. So bring your heart, but also make sure that what you're bringing to God is something that he's said that he wants in, in the truth and his word. So... Yeah, yeah, definitely. And listen, we got time for one more question. We have other questions, but if you sent in a question and we haven't had time to answer it, don't feel like we're just avoiding that question. We're going to try to actually go back through all the questions and uh, give kind of a detailed answer uh, if that's what the question requires. We've got, we've got your number, so we can like follow up with you. Everybody. Right, yeah. And Frank, call you number. We no, we won't. Uh, <laughs> we definitely won't do that. I but, like, but, I like. <laughs> But we have one, we'll time for one more question, and I guess it's the, the big question that a lot of people have. We kind of hear this all the time, really. And the question is, do people that go to the Church of Christ think that they're the only ones going to heaven? Oh, man. Um, I've grown up hearing a lot of uh, like jokes about that, or, you know, sometimes people saying it, and I think in a good, trying to say it in good fun, uh, but to me, it's, it's a joke that I don't think is very funny. Um, but, you know, the question is, do people in the Church of Christ think that all the ones going to heaven? Um, first of all, it doesn't matter what I think. Like, I don't, I don't have any say in that. Like, who's going to heaven? That's not my decision. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't get a vote on whether or not you go to heaven. So, um, so the question, in some ways, doesn't make sense because... Know, what does it matter what I think? Uh, but um, I guess the second thing I would say is I've never met anybody that's a member of the Church of Christ. I've never met anybody who would say, yes, that's exactly what I think. Um, maybe there's people out there like that, but, but that's not um, anybody that I've encountered. What I think we've got to be very careful, and this kind of ties back to the, the first point I just made. It's not, it's not up to me. What really, who's it up to? Well, it's up to it's up to all of us whether or not we decide to obey God. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, he says, Not all, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who obey the voice of my Father who's in heaven, those who do the will of my Father who's in heaven. So um, Jesus says there's going to be people at the end of this life who say, oh, yeah, Jesus is Lord. I, I love the Lord. And he'll look at them and say, you can't come in. Um and that's not, you know, we can get mad at, at people or individuals that would say that, but but when Jesus himself says, hey, there's a there's a, an easy way that leads to destruction, and there's a hard way that leads to life. And he says about the way that leads to life, he says, there are few who find it. And so it's not my call, it's not my decision to decide who goes to heaven. Uh, what is my decision and what, what is my business is whether or not I'm going to follow Jesus. Can I close with one more thought? Sure. Um, if you've still got your Bibles, I, I want to kind of close with this. Maybe you've never thought about this before, but look with me at John chapter 21, 
And I think I think the spirit of that question is a great, just a great way to, to end this discussion about the church. Uh, John chapter 21, uh, another episode between Jesus and Peter. They had a lot of episodes. Uh, but one of the last ones that we see uh, happens in John 21, verse 15. And I think this is so powerful. And it really it speaks a lot to me, and maybe it will speak to you. Um, it says, when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Lord, uh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And we, he does it again. He said to him, Tim, Tim, my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly I say to you, truly, truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. You're like, while we're reading this, stay with me. Here we go. Verse 19. Uh, he said this to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now you probably have in your Bible right there like a break in the, in the action. But pretend it's not there because man put the breaks in the action. God continued writing here, okay? So just keep reading. Peter turns. This is after Peter says, uh, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, you know I love you. And he's done this three times. Peter turned and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Uh, the one who'd been reclining at the table close to, him, close to him and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? This is John, by the way, who's saying all this. Uh, in verse 21, when Peter saw him, when he saw John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if, if, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. I think sometimes we can be like Peter and uh, we get into these questions uh, where, you know, God has told us what, what he wants and what he expects of us. He looks at Peter and he says, follow me. And Peter likes to turn around and he says, okay, but what about these people over here, Lord? What what about this hypothetical question? What about my, my grandfather and, and the way he worshipped or the way that he followed God or the way he didn't follow God? And we like to ask, like, questions like that. But I think it's really good to just look at what Jesus says right here. And he says, hey, what is that to you? You don't need to worry about that. Don't worry about everybody else. He looks at Peter and he says, that's not important. You follow me. And so when we get in this business of, of judging other people or judging other religious groups, let God take care of that. What, what is that to you or I? We're not the judge. And um, I hope that, that if you come and you visit here, uh, I, I think you'll, you'll find the people here that are not judgmental, that are very loving, and want to do their best to just follow what God said. Uh, we've got enough, as Philippians talks about, uh, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I've got plenty of things on my plate that I need to worry about in order to take care of my soul. I don't need to pass judgment on everybody else in the world and what they're doing. I've got, I just, I need to follow Jesus and God will reach out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much. You did a great job. We appreciate it. Uh, just to kind of wrap up and close out here uh, this evening, I just wanted to say, uh, if you're visiting here, you maybe you, you're not used to coming to church here, uh, and Philip said something that just kind of, you know, uh, it, it cuts you to the heart, and you were just feeling really pricked by it, uh, maybe it was even, you're feeling a little bit of almost anger or frustration, uh, you wanted to either uh, shut the broadcast off if you're online, or you wanted to kind of get up and just leave and, and not listen anymore, but you stayed, and you, you said, you know, I want to hear more, uh, and you're just kind of wrestling with something. Uh, can we just say that we said nothing here today uh, in a spirit of trying to uh, offend anyone, uh, but we, what we did say, uh, we hope you will wrestle with and really look in your heart and consider uh, what the Bible says, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what Philip says, it doesn't matter what I say or what whoever asked the question said, it doesn't matter what any of us says, it only matters what the Bible says, what God said. We just want to thank you again for tuning in. We hope that uh, this evening has really helped your spiritual life and has uh, just impacted your heart and you want to just continue to seek after God through the Bible. Uh, we hope that's the case. And if you come across, uh, if you have a question now that you, you didn't send in and you wanted to and uh, you just don't know what to do with it, 
go ahead and say it in now, and maybe we can respond to that uh, later on tonight or tomorrow or, or in the days to come. Uh, and that number again, and this will be the number all week long, so uh, you can just write it down and tune in tomorrow as well. The number is 859-588-7863. I'll say that one more time. 859-588-7863. We appreciate you so much. Hope you have a great night.